Samuel 17. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. They were gathered at Sochoch, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Sochoch and Azekar in Ephestamnim. Saul and the Israelites gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and formed ranks against the Philistines. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of bronze. He had greaves of bronze on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed six hundred shekels of iron and his shield-bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves, and let him come to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, Today I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man, that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel, when they were in the valley of Elhar fighting with the Philistines, David arose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper, took the provisions, and went as Jesse had commanded him. He came to the encampment as the army was going forth the battle, the battle line, shouting the war cry. 
Israel and the Philistines threw out for battle against army against army. David left the things in the charge of the keeper of the baggage, ran to the ranks, and went and greeted his brothers. And as he talked with them, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. Verse 32. And David said to Saul, Let no one's heart fail because of, because of him, Goliath. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said to David, You're not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for you are just a boy, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. Whenever a lion or bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, but this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, The Lord, who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, will save me from the hand of the Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. And Saul clothed David with his armour. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword over the armour and he tried to, in vain to walk, for he was not used to them. And then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I am not used to them. So David removed them. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the, the, the wadi and put them in the shepherd's bag, in the pouch, with his sling in his hand. And he drew near the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog? Did you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And this very day the Lord will deliver you by my hand, deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead body of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and the wild animals of the earth so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that, and that all the assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. And when the Philistine drew nearer to meet David, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on his forehead, and the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. Okay, it's a long reading, isn't it? And we've got the abbreviated version there. It finishes with uh, Saul sinking on the ground. I guess if we really wanted to follow the story through, it finishes with David returning to Jerusalem with uh, Saul's head. It's, you don't see that in the kids' versions of this story. Um, which I often think of the uh, Veggie Tales version. Does it end with um, David tickling Goliath's face with a feather duster or something like that? It's um, this is a story of violence. There's no doubt about that. And those who are concerned with the myth of redemptive violence will find this story distasteful. Um, the reality is, in the history of Israel, that there's a lot of violence, and uh, indeed that land is still marked by violence. I mean, it's uh, worth noting that, in fact, the words, the name of the Philistines is where we get the uh, name of Palestine from. But um, it's, uh, at the same time, we mustn't confuse the uh, Philistine people with modern Palestinian people any more than we want to confuse the um, 
ancient Israelites with the modern state of Israel. Uh, what we're dealing with today is two political entities. What we're dealing with here are two communities of faith, of opposing faiths. And this is, is the um, real issue here. I know we, we often take the David story as one of those heartwarming stories of showing how little people can do big things. You know, even if you're just a David with your your slingshot and your stones, um, you know, hey, you can topple giants. And it's not really the uh, point of, uh, of the story. The, the um, It's really a battle between two gods. You've got the Philistine cursing the people of Israel in the name of his gods, and you've got David saying, you haven't just defied uh you know, a political community here. You defied the God of Israel, and uh, it's the God of Israel who will will fight uh, for me and deliver you into my hand, which is what happens, of course. Um, having said that, there's nothing wrong with being reminded that little people can do big things. We'll have our second reading. I think the other point we should have made about that one, of course, is that, because um, it's going to tie into the New Testament reading, the extent to which the um, the contrast between faith and fear. Uh, the people, the ranks of the army of Israel are controlled by fear. Fear at the side of Goliath. Um, David, on the other hand, is the uh, archetype of faith who looks not at the terrible thing opposing him, but looks to God. A second reading is from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 6, the first 13 verses. As we work together with God, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain, for he says, an accept, at an acceptable time, I've listened to you on the day of salvation. I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found in, with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way through great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, Imprisonments, riots, labours, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness, lowliness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honour and dishonour, in ill repute and good repute. We treat it as impostors and yet are true as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. We have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affection, but only in yours. In return, I speak to you as children, open wide your hearts also. It's a beautiful, beautiful passage from the Apostle Paul and a reminder of the great affection he had for the uh, people in his care. Um, it feels almost embarrassing to read such a, a personal love letter of sorts as he shares it here with his uh, uh, beloved friends in Corinth. Um, as ever, you get the um, uh, paradoxical pairing of uh, Paul's authority uh, with his sufferings. You would have um, thought, and it's the uh, traditional perspective coming out of the Hebrew wisdom literature that... Um, if you're doing the right thing, you get rewarded. You get a good life. Uh, it's if, if things are going wrong for you, it's a bad sign. 
uh, you must be doing something wrong. I mean, as I say, that's there in, in the Proverbs fundamentally and in the Psalms to a, a great extent in that sort of a Hebrew wisdom literature tradition. It's questioned, of course, by Job and again in the book of Ecclesiastes, so it's not as if the uh, Hebrew faith gives a simplistic monochrome uh, line on, on this. But uh, in, in St Paul's case, we get a, a very monochrome line going the exact reverse direction. That it's the uh, it's the pain you experience that gives you authority. I mean, not just pain for pain's sake, of course, but pain and suffering and persecution specifically that comes out of doing the right thing, out of uh, service of the gospel. Paul always a controversial figure. I mean, yes, we look back at him now, a Bible full of letters, um, you know, that. that uh, in his name, uh, so he's a greatly revered figure in retrospect uh, during his own life, a far more controversial figure. And of course, it ends in in, in a bloody way, though we don't know the exact details. But um, a man with many enemies, a man whose um, words were disdained uh, by so many, but... Uh, a man who never lost faith in the uh, message which he felt had been entrusted to him, the message of, of Christ crucified. Foolishness, he recognised to many people. Uh, others thought, so many people thought he was an idiot. But uh, for him, he recognised in his message of the power of God to change lives and to bring new life. Again, an example of someone who lived not by in fear of uh, what other people said or in fear of the threats over his life, but looked to God and had confidence. We'll stand for the gospel. The Holy Gospel is written in the fourth chapter of the Gospel according to Mark, beginning at the 35th verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. On that day when the evening had come, Jesus said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him, took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. When the wind ceased, then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, it's a passage that is um, probably familiar to us, Jesus calming of the storm. And uh, it, it's a um, it's it's a confusing story in in many ways. Uh, you know why is Jesus sleeping in the back of the boat? Why did he lead him into the storm in the first place? And of course, the the question which is on the disciples' lips at the end, which which it ends with, "Who is this guy that the winds and the waves seem to obey him?" Um, so, yeah, it, there are no answers given at that point. Of course, later you'll get Peter saying, well, you are the Christ, the Son of the Most High God. And that goes some degree towards answering the question, though even then, who is this guy <laughs> that the wind and the, the sea obey him? It's important to realise, I think, that it's not just a magic trick on Jesus' part, that the sea uh, for the disciples 
I mean, they, they threatened to kill them, of course, but it's not just... The, the sea represents chaos in the, in the Hebrew mind. Um, if you, you look at the Hebrew people, they're not coastal people. It's the Philistines who we met in our Hebrew Bible reading who were the coastal people. They're, they're, they're the people who live by the sea and fish and live off the sea. The, the Hebrew people were content being inland and for the most part avoided the sea. I mean, curious, isn't it, that so many of Jesus' own disciples were sea people, were fishermen. But um, the sea is a fearful place. If you remember in uh, Genesis, it's the Spirit of God brooding on the waters is how creation takes place. And we see the waters uh, are pushed apart so that land uh, emerges. And this is how life begins with the pushing back of the waters. Uh, conversely, you'll remember in Genesis 4 how the waters cover the earth again in, in the time of Noah. And that's uh, the, the forces of chaos taking over again. So sea and chaos, and, and there are dangerous things that live in the, in the sea. A Leviathan and Behemoth, uh, Job speaks of, but symbolic again that under those deep, dark waves, terrible things lurk. The forces of chaos are there. The sea is not something the Hebrew people ever felt comfortable with, and not something I feel comfortable with. Um, I'm not a coastal person, but not just that. I mean, I, I, I don't want to talk too much about it, but ever since my dear eldest daughter, whose picture you'll see behind me there, when, when she was about not much older than that, um, came close to having a drowning accident in the Lane Cove River, and I won't give the details except to say I remember leaping in there and pulling her out from under the boat and it was just um, thank God um, this is the reality with uh, the sea is that you can go from being an idyllic day sort of enjoying yourselves on the Lane Clove National River Park we were that way my birthday you know had a nice little fun out boating together and within seconds the forces of chaos and death are there and um, it, it, it turns from being idyllic to being terrible in the blink of an eye because of the mysterious forces of the sea. I've never felt comfortable with the sea or boats since and um, which is why you appreciate when a couple of years ago I was um, uh, off, off the coast of Manus Island uh, well, just after we'd, we'd um, made um, our visit at uh, two in the morning, I think, to the uh, Manus Island Detention Centre. We sort of snuck in there by boat and visited the men, which um, you can still see the videos of those experiences are available, uh, and then tried to get out before we were um, with the uh, local naval team pursuing us and searchlights and all this sort of thing. Anyway, point being, I ended up in a boat spinning off the uh, the shore there amidst the coral reefs with two uh, men, the other two men, hanging off the side of the boat, uh, speaking pigeon very excitedly. I had no idea what they were saying, but I recognised there was something wrong with the boat. We weren't moving. We were spinning around amidst the coral reefs, and uh, given my... Uh, fear of the the water. Um, I thought that was my last moment. And it wasn't. I'm still here, thanks be to God. I've been <laughs> preserved. Uh, the point is, for the Hebrew people, the sea is a terrifying thing. You'll remember uh, Jonah, of course, and there are parallels here with the Jonah story. Jonah gets uh, thrown down into the sea and the sea calms immediately. Um, here, uh, there's no one thrown into the sea. Jesus simply stands up and, and rebukes the wind and the waves. It's interesting when um, the same verb here in the Greek for when Jesus earlier rebuked the uh, demoniac, the person possessed by evil spirits, it's the same word. He rebuked uh, the evil spirit. He rebukes the wind and the waves. 
in both cases, the result is um, calm and a restore to uh, proper human life. Um, in both cases, what we're dealing with are forces of chaos. <coughs> Pardon me. Forces that uh, are at work to disrupt human life and uh, all things good, whether they come in the form of troubling spirits that upset our, our emotions and, and um, turn us into people we're not, or whether it comes in the form of what we consider natural forces, winds and waves that uh, threaten to destroy us, they're the forces of chaos. And in both cases, um, Jesus has command over the forces of chaos. Uh, as I say, there's still much that is confusing about this story. How is it that uh, when the winds and the waves are beating against the boat, Jesus remains asleep? You know, was he faking? Was he just sort of testing the disciples, had sort of one eye sort of uh, still open? And uh, we've got to think it's probably not just a little dinghy, you know, which is often depicted as, but probably quite a sizable boat. But uh, so, you know, it wasn't necessarily being thrashed around in a way that would be impossible to, st to stay asleep. Having said that, you know, even a ship the size of the Titanic, uh, you, you'd start to know when, when things went wrong. Did Jesus have some divine power of sleep? <laughs> we don't know. I mean, how did Jesus sleep? We don't know. Why did Jesus lead, lead them into the storm in the first place? We don't know. I mean, why didn't he say to them when they said, let's get in the boat and go to the other side? Why didn't he say, guys, let's um, wait till the morning? <laughs> there are a lot of things we don't know. And uh, that's reflected in the final question of the disciples. Who is this guy? We, we, we can't understand him. It says they, they, they finish in great awe. Uh, the word could quite possibly better be translated that they were terrified. They were terrified not only of... They had been terrified of, of what seemed to be the uh, death they were about to have through the the uh, storm but terrified of jesus too i mean who is this guy even the winds and the waves obey him who is this guy who decided to calm the storm rather than prevent us going into the storm um who is this guy and you know i think that's the question we're left with uh, the the clear answer i think we get from this is is that uh, whoever jesus is uh, he's someone we can trust. And the, the contrast, again, as with the, uh, in our Hebrew Bible reading, and to a lesser extent in the, the epistle reading, the contrast is between living in faith and living in fear. As I say, with the uh, armies of the Israelites, David is the figure who, you know, who says, you know, you haven't divided me, you've divided God, this is not, Instead of sort of focusing on the, the odds of uh, beating the heavyweight champion of the world um, as a mere boy, we recognise that the battle is not between me and the champ, it's between the champ and God. And um, similarly here, the issue is not the, the horror of the storm, the... the wind and the waves that threaten to engulf us and destroy us. The uh, battle is between the storm and God. God can deal with this. Jesus can deal with this. Who is this guy? Well, he's someone who can calm the wind and the waves. He's someone who can uh, deal with everything life throws at us. And he is someone we know who loves us. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word.